Hey, last week after service, we went out to lunch with Amy's mom and dad. After just a minute, I came in just a little late, I sat down, they handed me the menu, and after just like a minute, the the waitress came by and she said, do you guys know what you want to order? Do you know what you want? And I was about to say, we need a few more minutes, and my father-in-law and said, yes, we're ready. So out of panic and peer pressure, I ended up ordering a Reuben sandwich. I've never ordered a Reuben sandwich in my life before. But when confronted with the question, what do you want? I just panically said, I guess sauerkraut and shaved beef. I don't know. Give me a Reuben sandwich. Anybody else ever have the stress of trying to make a decision in front of them? It could be a big thing or a little thing. What am I going to wear to the church picnic? Or it can be, am I going to move out of state? But there's stress, at least for me, often there's stress associated with making a decision. A few weeks ago, I was talking to our youth pastor, Denise, and uh, she told me that she does not stress about making decisions. She walks into a store and she buys the middle. She doesn't buy the most expensive vacuum. She doesn't buy the cheapest vacuum. She buys the middle vacuum. And when she told me that, I just could, could not believe it, Denise. You're lucky I'm not shaming you and rebuking you up here to set correction. That is just not who I am. A few, like a year ago, I bought a new cell phone, and with a new cell phone means a new phone case. And so you know what I did? I, I, I watched hours of reviews of phone cases. I had parameters of how far can it drop and still be safe. I want real leather, not fake leather. And I just watched all these re- different reviews, and so I ended up ordering five cases. And I lined all five cases up and smelled them, felt them. How did they feel? Does the phone fit right? And I'll tell you what, I picked the best case in the world. I'm really, really happy with it. If you want it later, I'll give you a link so I get a kickback on the commission on it. But it's a great case. But when it comes to making a decision, I take my time to figure it out. How many of you are like that? Not as many as I thought. How many of you are more like Denise and just, I'm going to buy the middle? I can, Pastor Roy says this, I can make a decision. It may not be a good decision or the best decision, but I can make a decision. How many of you are like that? We're going to pray for wisdom for you today. I mean, the altar calls for you today. Oh, man, you guys are horrifying. Okay. We just started a series called Summer with the Sage, and this summer we're going to be studying the life and the writings of the wisest men ever to live named King Solomon. At the very beginning of King Solomon's reign to the kingdom, the very beginning of him stepping into ruling, he had to answer this question, what do you want? And the answer was so much more important than choosing what you're going to eat, a cheeseburger, a Reuben sandwich, picking a best phone case or a vacuum. Because the person asking the question was God. And so what Solomon's answer here, it will dictate the rest of what we are pursuing for the whole summer. His answer is what we're going to give the next few weeks to studying and learning and working to apply in our lives. So if you would, you can turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at this, uh, this encounter between Solomon and God and how Solomon approaches the answer of what do you want? And we're going to see what he asked God for. So chapter 3 of 1 Kings. Solomon at, made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he married one of his daughters. He brought her to live in the city of David until he could finish the building of his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around the city. At that time, the people, the people of Israel sacrificed their offerings at local places of worship for a temple honoring the name of the Lord had not yet been built. We talked about this last week, how the thing that marks Solomon's life more than his wisdom, more than his wealth, is the construction of God's temple. Solomon loved the Lord and followed all of the decrees of his father, David, except that Solomon, too, offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local places of worship, which is why he's building the temple. The most important of these places of worship was at Gibeon. So the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. Can anybody say overkill? Turn to your neighbor and say overkill. Anybody ever been to a wedding where they did like a pig roast? No, is that just an Indiana thing? Well, we do pig roast where I'm from. One pig is going to feed 200 people, okay? Here Solomon is, and he does 1,000 burnt offerings. Turn to your other neighbor and say, overkill. One pig is enough, Solomon. No, you can say that too. One pig's enough. 
We're having fun today, guys. This is fun. We're going, this is so much fun. We have fun. And so he says 1,000 burnt offerings. Say overkill. <laughs> you guys will do anything I say. Okay, that night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, what do you want? And I will give it to you. I want you to pause for just a second here and not pass over this sentence here. Imagine that you go to sleep and you have one of those more than real life kind of dreams. My wife's a very, very vivid dreamer. And often she'll get dreams from the Lord and she'll, she'll ponder them and write on them and think about them. But sometimes her crazy subconscious just makes up things that feels more real than life. And often it has to do with me. And she'll wake up in real life mad at me saying, what did you do? I said, I don't know, what did I do? I just woke up. She said, well, I had a dream. Wait, so in your fake dream, you had a dream about me? Yes, you pig. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I wasn't in control. And so Solomon's having a dream, a real life. He's really there. He can smell the air. He can breathe. He can feel the oxygen coming in and out. And it's his encounter with God. So I want you to imagine that you're having that encounter with God right now. And maybe for God, if you think of God, and maybe you've never done this before, but when you think of God, maybe it's just a presence. Maybe when you think of God, you feel something. Maybe when you think of God, immediately this, this old man with a long beard comes to mind, like a Zeus-like character. Maybe when you think of God as a person, or a feeling, or just a presence around you. But right now, I just encourage you, take a second and... Know that God's here. How do you perceive him? You're all going to encounter him some way in your heart, and so how do you see God? And so Solomon encounters God, and God asks him this question, what do you want? And so before we go on much further, I want you to think about this question. Here God is, your mental picture, an impression, a feeling. What? Do you want? If God was here, right here, holding a microphone, speaking to you and saying, What do you want? I will give it to you. What's your real life answer? Some of you just wished for three more wishes. It doesn't work. What do you want? person, the author, the power behind everything in the universe has, the person that could give you anything you ask for is asking Solomon, what do you want? What do you want? Warren Wearsby, he says it this way, he says, your answer to this question, your answer reveals what you believe about yourself and the work God has called you to do. What do you want? Here is God, the one who is able to give you anything, and your answer is going to dictate the rest of your life. I wonder how you just responded. What did you ask for? What do you believe about yourself, and what do you believe God's called you to do? Because you don't waste a question like that. You don't waste the answer to that question. You want something, if God really was here, if he could really, he was going to give you anything that you asked for, you would think about that, weigh it, think about what would, what's the thing I truly need the most? And you would respond in kind. Your answer reveals what you believe about yourself and the work God has called you to do. And so will Solomon ask for an unending respect from those he rules? Will he ask for security or safety, comfort, an easy life? What does Solomon believe about himself and who God's called him to be? And so we get to verse 9. He says, give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased with Solomon that Solomon had asked for wisdom. What do you want, Solomon? I can give you anything you want. What do you want? And Solomon's answer is wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me the ability to know what is right and know what is wrong. Give me the ability to apply what I know into real life. Give me wisdom. This is what we're going to be spending our, spending our summer studying, is pursuing wisdom. What is wisdom? How do we get it? How do we get it into our lives? How do we apply it? Because wisdom is the thing that marks King Solomon. He is known as the Bible states him, as the wisest man to ever lived. 
How do we get some of that wisdom into our lives? So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And then God ends this encounter with Solomon with this reminder. Verse 14, and if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commandments as your father David did, I will give you a long life. And if you remember from last week, this call to a committed life of worship echoes the same thing that David did to his son. The very last words that David has, the very last encounter on his deathbed. As one king passes on all the knowledge, anything can give him. Son, let these words guide you into the future. This from God echoes David's words to Solomon just a page or two beforehand. Follow the word of God. Follow all of his decrees. Do all of them without compromise. And as we're going to find out over the summer, this is the theme underneath wisdom of Solomon's life. The wisest man on earth, follow God without compromise. And so perhaps the very first thing that we can recognize here is that godly wisdom trumps our earthly desires. Godly wisdom is better or it trumps our earthly desires. The thing that God applauds about Solomon is that he does not hyper-focus on the things that most rulers would have focused, most people would focus on, that most people might ask God for. Instead of saying, give me wealth and health, give me an easy life, give me what I want, please make my life good, please make it fun, please make it pleasurable, he says, give me wisdom. The first thing that we can take away from Solomon's story is that godly wisdom will always trump our desires. This is the Midwest. And one of the things about being raised or born in the Midwest is that we are raised on cards. I don't know about your family and what specific deck of cards that you played, whether it was Uno or Euchre or Spades or Hearts or Solitaire, but most likely you were raised playing cards. And for me and my family come from Indiana, the game is Euchre. Anybody else a Euchre fan? Well, no, we have work to be done in this church. You guys, come on. Euchre's the best game in the world. Okay, so we were raised playing Euchre, and one of the key components about Euchre is figuring out the trump suit of the cards. And if you play cards, this is a familiar concept, is that the lowest card of the trump suit will always beat the highest card of an offsuit. Meaning this, if you play an ace, which is a really high card, a really good card, but somebody else plays a two of trump, the lowest card in the deck, that trump will beat the highest offsuit card. Godly wisdom will always trump our desires. It's not a bad thing to ask for health. It's not a bad thing to ask for financial stability and peace. It's not a bad thing to ask for things from God that you desire and that you want. But Solomon went beyond asking just for a good thing. He asked for the best thing. Because godly wisdom will always trump our desires. Can you just say that with me? That godly wisdom will always trump our earthly desires. Wisdom trumps our wants. And so there's a lot of good things that maybe we just even thought in our mind. If God was here and he's asking me, what do you want? I don't want a Reuben sandwich. A Reuben sandwich was good, but I want the best thing on the menu. What's the best thing? What's the most satisfying thing? What's the thing that I will crave and rave about and tell other people about later? I don't just want a good thing from God. I want the best that he has to offer me. And that's not a selfish thing or a bad thing. That's a thing that all of us should desire. Because you have a God that wants to give you his best. God actually wants you to live your best life. He wants you to live a life that is satisfying, where you are using your passion and your giftings. He wants you to have relational soundness around you, and he wants you to have peace. But you do not get there by circumventing it and coming around and just saying, I just want this right here without you. I want the good life without the devoted life. 
I want an easy life without having to work for it. And so Solomon is demonstrating that godly wisdom trumps our earthly desires. What do you want? I want your wisdom in my life. As many good things that we want, there are just amount, maybe even more bad things that we want that fight against this idea of being wise. Being lazy or dishonest, looking lustfully at other men or women who are not our spouse. Gossiping behind somebody's back because it feels good. Cheating on a test. Responding to somebody out of impatience or because they deserve it. Those are our desires inside of us. Not good desires, not healthy desires, but desires that fight our wisdom. If we, I, Amy and I often think about this, if we lived how we make our children live, we'd be such healthier people. Can, can I have another piece of cake? No, that's not wise. Your stomach will hurt. Uh, can I watch another show? No, it's late. You need to go to bed and get eight hours of sleep. Can I play a game on your phone or iPad? No, that's not good for your mind. Go outside and play with your sibling. Can I go to Vincent's house? No, he's a bad influence on you. That may be a very specific one to me. <laughs> Can I jump off the trampoline in the pool? We actually didn't ask mom to today. We actually didn't grow up asking my mom that question. We waited till she left the house. And then we asked dad to move the trampoline next to the pool so we could jump off the trampoline, duck under the power cord, and land into the pool. And so we know that wisdom fights our desires, whether they're good or whether they're bad. Often you see this head to head about this is what I want, but what I really want is godly wisdom in my life. Wisdom trumps our wants. And naturally, wisdom leads to a longer life. Maybe don't jump off the trampoline or off the roof into the pool and you might live a little bit longer. Amen? Soon we're going to talk about what wisdom is and what at its very base, what the scripture tells us that it is. But what, something that I just want to give us a baseline for today is what Solomon is demonstrating to kind of prepare the groundwork for that conversation of defining wisdom is to get this idea or the theme or the feel the aroma of wisdom, that when you ask for wisdom, the pursuit of wisdom is always a pursuit of more God in your life. When you pursue godly wisdom, because there's earthly wisdom too, when you pursue godly wisdom, what you're asking for is not just when to know to sell your house or to hold on to it, invest into stock or not, go to this school district or not. You're not just asking for a good thing or a wise thing, asking for godly wisdom. And you are not just saying, Lord, help me to know how to get ahead in life. You're saying, Lord, I want more of you in my life. And that's what Solomon is really saying. He loved the Lord. Scripture tells us that. And so he's saying, God, I don't want peace. I, I, I'm not going to ask you for peace. I'm not going to ask you for riches. I'm not going to ask you for fame or popularity. What I really want, Lord, is more of you in my life. What I really want is just not to be well-respected and to be a ruler of these people. What I really want to be known for is godly wisdom in my life. Would you lead me going forward? And so when we pursue godly wisdom in our lives, it is always a pursuit of more God in our lives. We're going to pause on our story of King Solomon. And we're going to actually compare this to another story that's... When you start comparing them, putting them together, it reminds you and you start seeing similarities to it. And so we're actually going to turn your Bible all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord pl God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat this fruit, you are sure to die. God does not withhold the ability to make the choice from you. There's always that choice of pursuing your own way of life, of going about riches or fame or peace or whatever the thing is that you are pursuing after, the thing that's most important to you, the thing that gives you most security in life. Some people would have, rather have a life full of adventure instead of have financial stability. Some people would rather never go on a vacation and have financial stability. 
because it brings a sense of control or comfort or, to, or gives you completion in your life. And God does not restrict you from making those decisions. He allows you to choose. The tree of life and the tree of good and evil are right there next to each other. You choose. You could have your own wisdom. You could pursue life. There's many ways that you could go about life. There's many ways you could go about life. And at the end of your life, depending on your definition of a good life, you may have had a good life or a successful life. Was it the best life? Was it the life that God intended for you to have? And so you have that choice before you, pursuit of earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. The pursuit of godly wisdom is always a pursuit of more God in your life. When you pursue godly wisdom, it always uh, trumps our earthly desires. And so we're going to skip to chapter 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. You will be like God knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. You'll notice that this is a pattern that plays out again and again in the Bible and again and again in our own lives, is that when we want something different or uh, contrary to what God offers or tells us, it will always lead to emotional damage later. It will always lead to relational abuse later. So here's this good thing, this okay thing that they're set, and as soon as they make that choice of being wise in their own eyes, pursuing a way other than the way that God says to go, immediately shame follows. You, you have probably experienced this in your life. There is this thing that you didn't want to do, but in the moment you really, really wanted to do it, and in the moment of weakness or in the moment of uh, rebellion, you decided to do it. And as, as soon as you did it, you immediately felt shame. As soon as you did it, there was emotional damage that came out of it. As soon as you did it, you wish you could go back and redo it because what you thought in the moment, this is going to feel good, this is going to bring security, this is going to make me uh, satisfied or happy. As soon as you went through with it, it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. It was a lie. You were tricked. You allowed yourself to be deceived. Uh, uh, a uh, dumb way or a dumbed down version of this is saying, uh, I'm going to eat a bowl of ice cream at night for dinner instead of dinner. And in the moment, that's great. In the moment, that's okay. In the moment, I, you know, if I'm more than honest with you, I've done that more than I'd like to tell you. But as soon as I'm done, I think, why did I eat all those unnecessary calories? Oh, man, I feel like junk now. Why did I eat something healthy? And that salad is just sitting there going bad. The one on the back left in the bottom row, the part where I push all the way back so I can make room for the cookies. So let's get back there. Why did I eat a salad? Why did I eat something healthy? I want to be faithful to my wife, but it's late at night, and I have a desire, and I asked, and she said no. My phone's right there, and pornography is so easy to watch. And I pull out my phone, and I flip to something that I want in the moment, but as soon as I do it, I feel shame. I feel regret. I feel a deep desire of just wishing I had, could go back, and what is it? What is that thing of in the moment that you say, this is what I want. This is going to make me feel good. This is going to bring me happiness. This is going to fulfill my desire in this moment. Godly wisdom always trumps our earthly desire. When we pursue godly wisdom in our life, it's always a pursuit of God. More of God in our lives. It's always a pursuit of his best in our lives. And if you're feeling down on yourself right now, 
Can you go back 20 minutes, 30 minutes to the beginning of this when you heard Lizzie talking about that? Can you go back one week and hear a sermon about it's okay, you can always course correct? Isn't that the beautiful thing about God is that we had about two and a half chapters of life that was perfect and good, and then you have the rest of your Bible about God coming back and restoring a way back to him to course correct. And so you will and you probably have made a decision that it seemed wise in your own eyes, but it was off of God's course. It wasn't godly wisdom. You were just pursuing life in your own way, and now you're out of bounds, and you feel shame. You've hurt relationships. You have things spiraling out of control. But God comes back, and he asks you again, what do you want? Do you, do you want me to lead you in this? Do you want wisdom? Do you want me to direct you? And whenever you get into that moment, you'll have this choice again. Do I follow? Do I follow what I think is best? Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. You'll notice that uh, Eve did what was wise in her own eyes. Adam did what he thought was wise in his own eyes. He wanted the wisdom that the fruit could give instead of trusting that God would give him what he needed. There's always this tension in us of saying, is God holding out on me? Do I truly want the wisdom that God offers? Do I truly want the life that God offers? The Lord asks us to bring the tithe into the house. Don't talk about money, Josh. The Lord asks us to bring tithe into the house. But Lord, I can't. That's uncomfortable. I wasn't raised that way. Why would I give my money to that? Have you seen the news? There's been churches and people that abused it. I better just hold on to it. Why would I have to gather in church? Can't I just do that on my own? I have my own Bible. I can turn on Spotify worship. Why is it important to gather in church? And so quickly we find ways to go about life in a way that's satisfying to me. It's so easy to find a way to go about life that you can convince yourself and trick yourself is better than the, what God said. The tree of life and the tree of death, the knowledge of good and evil, right next to each other. And Satan convinced her, tricked her, allowed her to walked down a a path of human logic that made it easy to make a decision to step away from God's intended direction. And so you have the choice again today. Will you pursue God? Will we be wise in our own eyes? Or will we follow him? This summer we're studying the life of Solomon and his writings, and it's in a pursuit of wisdom. This summer we're pursuing God more and more of God together. And so I just want to give you a few ideas of how you might be able to do that. The book of Proverbs, which is accredited to Solomon writing most of it, is 31 chapters. If you read a chapter a day, you'll have read through the book of Proverbs two times before we get over with this series. And so corporately, we could just start tomorrow. Read chapter one and then read chapter two and put a bookmark there and just keep going. You actually have this handy-dandy built-in bookmark. Just put this thing right there and just let it travel with you. I'd love to hear from you guys on this series. On our Facebook this morning, we posted a a picture and a page of just asking, what's your favorite proverb? Or what's a proverb that you'd like to hear more teaching on or have a question about? I'd love to hear from you guys of what's the things that you are looking for wisdom in your life about this summer? How are you, this is, so informal, it's so formal for me to be able to be up here and speaking to you, but how are you interacting with God in the season of searching for wisdom? I'd love it if this summer we pursued wisdom together. If we looked for more God in our life, more of his direction, more of his willingness, more of his will in our life. Hmm. I just want to read... 1 Kings chapter 3 again. 
So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for, and I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world would be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey all my decrees and my commandments, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Right now, if you're in here today and you need godly wisdom in your life, can I just ask you to respond by raising your hand? Amen. Amen, John. I see those double hands. Me too. There are things every single day that I come against that I say, God, I need godly wisdom. I need your direction. I need your will in this moment. Godly wisdom is always trumps our earthly desires. Godly wisdom is always a a pursuit of more of God in our lives. God, I, I actually trust that what you say is the best way. I trust that when you say to pursue you first in my worship, in my time, in my finances, in my relationships, that you will satisfy me. I trust you. And I want more of you in my life. So church, can we just stand for a second and just close like this? I just want to give you a second to worship. Many, many of you raised your hands right now. And I just give you a second before we go out and before we play volleyball, before we eat food and Costco hot dogs, would you just take a moment to just, Lord, I'm here. Make your desire known to God. What do you want? Lord, I want wisdom. What do you want? Lord, I want more of you in my life. What do you want? Lord, I want a desire to pursue you. What do you want? Lord, I I want the strength to be able to say no when my wants seem so strong. What do you want? Lord, I want the conviction to be able to live the life that I, I, I know I should be living. What do you want, church? Father, right now, would you just speak to us? Would you just minister to us, God, as we need it? Lord, we just begin to direct our minds, God, to where we need to be headed. I believe there might be somebody in here today, God, that is saying, I, I actually don't want that, but I want the desire to want godly wisdom in my life. If I was really honest, I actually want these earthly things more, but I want to want the desire to follow God. And Lord, would you respond to that right now? Lord, would you just give us a hunger for you? Would you give us a a, a desire, God, to have more and more of your presence, more and more of your will in our lives? Laura's going to close service here in just a second, but church, the altar team is going to come in just a moment, and they'll be up here. I just encourage you not to step out of this moment too quickly. In a couple weeks, we're going to figure out where wisdom comes from and how to get it. And it's very simple, though. I'll give you the end of the next sermon. Ask God for it. James says, ask God for wisdom. He is faithful to give it. The Lord loves you, church. He's here in this moment. Your need, your desire, your thing that's consuming your thoughts right now is not too small or too insignificant. He's not too busy. He's here in this moment right for you. He's powerful enough to give you his full attention and you your his full attention right now. What do you want? Don't squander, don't waste this moment. Don't order a Reuben sandwich. Really think about it. You have the ear and the attention of your God. And he's here to meet with you. Amen.